We are here. This morning is not only Easter Sunday, this is the culmination of our Spiritual Disciplines series. Now, if you have not been with us, you can find all of these on our YouTube channel or on our website. But the Spiritual Discipline series has been a, a series, a very practical series, about how to do some of the things that are in our toolbox to just help put us in the presence of God. Now, we all understand that we do not earn our own salvation. We do not sanctify ourselves. We do not do any of this work. God does all that. And yet there are things that you and I do just as practices that just help put us in the presence of God and allow God to show up and do work in our lives. And so we've had a whole sermon series where we've talked about um, prayer and fasting and simplicity and solitude um, and service and worship and a lot of other ones. And if you missed any of those, we have both the Sunday mornings and the Wednesday nights recorded on our website. Um, and it's a fantastic kind of toolbox for you. This morning, the culmination of the series is the final discipline that we're going to talk about, which is the discipline of celebration. Joy is a practice. And the reason we're putting this on Easter is very, very intentional. Remember I said the Easter season, Easter is a season, not a day. The Easter season is 50 days. That is very intentional because it is the longest season of the church year. Lent is 40 days. Easter is 50 days. You know what? They did that on purpose because as important as it is to repent of your sin, it is more important to celebrate that you've been forgiven. And we have these kind of two halves of Christianity, the repent, the pay attention to the darkness inside of you that needs to be healed, pay attention to the brokenness that needs to be healed, pay attention to everything that is, as Millie said, of the old world, of the old creation that's still waiting for the redemption of God. That's kind of lent in a nutshell. And I'll tell you what, Christians get a bad rap for that. <laughs> Because there's a whole lot of accusations that we are making people uh, just, you know, face first in the dirt and just wallowing guilt and all of this kind of stuff. But the other half of that is that Christianity has proclaimed that Easter that follows Lent is actually more important. And you know what you're supposed to do during Easter? Nothing but party. You are supposed to celebrate for 50 days. And you notice the 50 days is longer than the 40 days. Because while they are both important, the empty tomb is actually more important. Because had there not been an empty tomb, the cross would not have gained significance. The cross gains its significance from the fact that it is followed by the resurrection, by the empty tomb. And so as much as Christianity asserts that you do need to repent, and you do, and as much as Christianity asserts that you do need to know the sins of which you need to repent, and you do, Christianity also asserts that if you go through life without celebration, you're missing the point. And if you go through life without joy, you're missing the point. And if you go through your life without knowing how to practice joy as a spiritual discipline, you are living a half-life less than we were ever intended to live. This morning, I want to talk about joy as a practice, as a discipline. Because I'll tell you what, half of you are out there thinking about joy as something you get when you're lucky, something when everything is going your way, and you might have this really good feeling that's happiness, it's great, it is not joy. Joy is a discipline that is something you practice and something you practice intentionally the same way you practice prayer, even though you sometimes don't feel like it, the same way you practice fasting, even though you sometimes don't feel like it, the same way you practice any of the other disciplines on Easter and sometimes throughout the year, it is your duty as a Christian to rejoice to notice the good things, to delight in them. And even though there are things in your world that are not yet as you would have them be or not yet as God would have them be, yet you notice and rejoice in all that is truly good around you. Now, there are a couple of things I want to say about this this morning because this, this is a habit and a practice that could indeed make us very popular if we preached it more, and yet what I find is it tends to be misunderstood because our culture also has a, a practice of celebration 
But if you notice, most of what people recommend as a means of practicing joy, it is some form or rather of disconnecting from our rather real life rather than engaging more in our real life, right? So when I was asking a group of, I was teaching young um, women when, during my first year in ministry, it was a bunch of young college women, like what would a joyful weekend look like for you? And it was... Um, go to see a movie, it was have a spa day, it was a whole lot of, there's, there's kind of a, a treat me culture that has grown up, um, that because I am such a, a great person, I deserve to spend a whole lot of money on myself, and that was a whole lot of what they were naming off, but everything was a way of, of, of disconnecting from the real good things that were actually in their life. Um, it's the same thing I've seen with people, you know, um, the most common form of, of numbing from the things that are actually in your life, people use like alcohol and drugs, we always talk about that. But what I discovered from being a grown-up and watching grown-ups is that people use literally anything, anything, as this way of numbing and disconnecting and pushing away the, the, the real life that's in front of them. And you look around at our culture and that's what we call joy. Getting away on a week-long vacation to escape it all is joy, but engaging for a week-long intentional time with my family is not. Um, gosh, there are so many examples. I'm going to have to like, just stop talking because I'm just going to go over the examples the entire time. But the thing is, when I started thinking about how people practice joy in our culture, and what Christians claim a practice of joy looks like. This is why this sermon is the culmination of spiritual discipline series. Because what Christians would say is the more deeply you are engaged in your disciplines, the more they are going to lead to the true and honest and authentic joy that comes from an obedient relationship to God. So, fasting... Puts, uh, takes us away from food for a time in order to allow us to really enjoy food when we come back to it. Simplicity takes us away from the excess that drowns us or threatens to drown us so that we can truly enjoy the things we have. Solitude takes us away from the... Uh, the roar of people's opinions all around us so that we can truly enjoy companionship when we come back to it. You go through the disciplines and you will find every single one of them is a training in some capacity to actually enjoy the real things that God has put in your life. And so when Christians talk about joy, when Christians talk about rejoicing, it is not that I'm going to rejoice, I'm going to buy myself a bigger house and rejoice, <laughs> I'm going to buy myself a huge vacation and that's my rejoicing, it is that I am going to receive the gifts God has given me that are good. I'm going to notice them, I'm going to receive them, and I am going to enjoy them and I'll tell you what, when you have been trained by the disciplines to not be scattered, to go this way, this way, this way, this way, you start to discover more and more and more good that is in your life. We had an example of this recently. We, uh, the discipline of simplicity is a work in progress at my household. Always work in progress. And one of the ways that it has been a work in progress recently is we have been committed to uh, fewer impulse purchases for my children. Um, my children love impulse purchases and they're really loud and so I end up giving in to them a lot. And so we've, 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 nailed, we've really pared that down. Fewer toys, fewer things. We're just gonna, we're gonna concentrate on what we have. And you know what happened is we ended up really focusing in on buying just one toy that they really wanted. And you know what happened? They loved it. 
they enjoyed it so much and they didn't play with it one time, they played with it over and over and over. And because there wasn't all this other clutter coming in, there wasn't all these distractions away from it. And they enjoyed it for what it was and then they kept enjoying it. And as I was watching them, I was realizing that me as an adult person, if I practice the disciplines that God has given me, would look around my real life and actually enjoy and rejoice in the real good things that I have. Because let me tell you, life is real hard sometimes, and I can be real negative sometimes. I can be so negative that I can overlook the miracles that are in front of me every single day. We see a few examples of this in the Gospels, especially in this morning's text. So there's, there's a couple of different Easter texts about the empty tomb. All of them are shocking to the people who engage them because um, the disciples were not expecting an empty tomb on Easter morning. The disciples were expecting to find Jesus' body. So um, the one you have in your bulletin is actually from Luke. I want to read the one from John real quick, and then I might come back to the one from Luke. This is John 19, beginning with... um, No, this is John 20. John 20, beginning with verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. So I want you you to just pause there for a second. So this this is Easter Sunday morning. This is the morning... When the world discovers that God had a plan all along, that God is good, that God is victorious, that life overcame death, that Easter is going to be more important than Lent, this is the morning we discover that joy won. Mary Magdalene is the first person to see it, and yet what does she assume when she sees the tomb? She doesn't come back and say the tomb was empty. She says... They have taken him, and we do not know where they have laid him. So the assumption she makes from an empty tomb is that somebody's stolen the body. The assumption she makes from seeing this evidence of the resurrection is not that this is evidence of the resurrection, but that there is yet more cause to weep because of all the terrible things that happen in the world. Someone did something even more terrible. And so she makes that assumption, she runs back, and she sees, um, and so Peter, and then it says the disciple whom Jesus loved. Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved were running together. The other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came, following him, went into the tomb, saw the linen wrappings and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself, Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. Now listen to this. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must also rise from the dead, and the disciples returned to their homes. So in that story, we have three different characters. We have Mary Magdalene, we have Peter, and then we have this disciple whom Jesus loved. All three see the same evidence, All three reach the empty tomb. Only one of them believes. And I'll tell you what, that story has stuck with me for many, many years. Especially on Easter mornings. Because what it reminds me of is that it reminds me of the fact that the evidence of God can be all around us and only one person recognizes it for what it is. Right? It reminds me of the fact that the goodness of God, the reality of the goodness of God, the reason for rejoicing, the evidence of God's miracle can be all around us. And yet it is possible to be so firmly rooted in our own negativity that we look at the empty tomb in the face and we refuse to rejoice because we do not see it as evidence for joy. We see it as evidence for yet another crime. And yet, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the story was, it was not a crime scene. It was the empty tomb. 
It was, this, it was the place where heaven met, met earth. It was the place where God showed up on earth. It was the place where God's miracles were done. It was a place where life overcame death and joy overcame sorrow. And all of those ancient promises were finally fulfilled. This was the evidence of the greatest work of God in the history of the world. And yet two people saw it and could not see it. And one person saw it for what it was. The one whom Jesus loved. And while we, there's a whole lot of mystery around the one whom Jesus loved, we might suspect that he had spent a whole lot of time in the company of Jesus, learning to see things the way Jesus saw them. And friends, I wonder if you and I spent the same company with Jesus, learning to see things the way Jesus saw them, if we might look around our lives and see far more empty tombs than we currently see. I wonder if we spent that much time in the company of Jesus that you and I might look around our, 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 our lives and have our eyes opened to the fact that maybe there is a greater cause for rejoicing than we had thought. Let me tell you, it is hard to be a grown-up in this world. It's hard to be a kid in this world also. It's hard to be in this world. Life is hard. You go through seasons of life that you're just barely putting one foot in front of the other, and then when you get out of them, the memory of that season is so heavy on you that it, it seems, feels like that season is not even fully gone yet. And I, I've talked to so many people who spend their lives looking around at other people saying, well, they don't have it as hard as I did, and they don't have it as hard as I did, and let me just tell you, as someone who hears lots of stories, you all have it hard, everyone. I don't know of a single person who doesn't have it hard, and yet... And yet, the evidence of the goodness of God is everywhere. And the more you are embroiled in the hardness of your own experience, the more you will find yourself blinded to the goodness that is in front of your face. Because Lent is shorter than Easter. Lent is shorter than Easter. Weeping may last for a light for a time, but joy comes with the morning, and the morning does come, and in your life, you will see the goodness of God, and the question is, will you recognize it, and this morning on Easter Sunday, the question of the discipline of joy is, will you rejoice when you see it? Will you rejoice when you see it? Here's what that means on a very practical note. It means, first of all, you get your head out of your phone and notice things. It means, second of all, that you have the ability to discern what is actually good versus what is not good in your life. There are things that are pleasurable but not good. Scrolling TikTok for three hours is very pleasurable. It is not good, right? Over drinking can be very pleasurable. It is not good. You have to be able to discern the things in your life that are good. And the third is this. You have to be willing to stop and rejoice when you see something good, even if you might not really feel like it at the time. The other morning, we were um, playing in our front yard, and I was responding to emails <laughs> um, because I've got a phone, and it's very handy to be able to respond to emails. And there was one particular email that had just put me in like a mood not the best mood to be in around my kids, but I was in, so I was in this, I had not fully processed why I was in a bad place, um, but it was because of something that was not related to my kids, and I was in the process of taking it out on them. When Annabelle comes over to me, and she stops me, she, she takes my hand, puts my phone down, and she goes, Mom, there's a butterfly. And so we have milkweed in our yard. We get quite a lot of butterflies. My kids are very well acquainted with the life cycle of a butterfly, and they know that butterflies are worth stopping for, right? Whatever else is happening, it doesn't matter if we're late, it doesn't matter if we are um, throwing things in the car, you see a butterfly, it is worth stopping for and looking at. And so I knew, because I knew this was like our family language, I was like, okay, I'm going to put my phone down, and I allowed her to take my hand and pull me over, and we looked at the butterfly, and we just, and I mean, five-year-olds, if you can't be happy around a five-year-old, you've got an issue, right? She just brought joy back, right? And she was telling me, look how beautiful it is. Look how big the wings are. Fly, little butterfly, fly. And then we had to sing a song about a butterfly. And by the end of that, I was in a completely different place. And I found myself wondering what would have been lost 
if there was a butterfly flying by that hadn't been noticed? What would have been lost in the world if there's a flower blooming that nobody notices? What is lost in the world if there is an act of kindness that nobody notices? What is lost in the world if there's a, a thing of beauty that nobody rejoices over? And Christians say that there is a very real thing lost. And what is lost is our joy and our potential for joy and our glimpse of heaven. Because when you allow those good things to pass you by and keep your head focused on that which is less than heaven, then you find yourself living in a world that is less than the world we actually live in. And you find yourself missing the joy that God has put all around you and the opportunity for joy that God has put all around you. Because you were not meant to go through this life with your head down getting through. You were meant to go through this life rejoicing, singing, delighting, noticing, and loving the real good things that God has put in front of you. And so, my friends, whether you are a Westminster person and you're going to be here every week, or whether you are here once and we never see you again, this is your mission. You've got 50 days. And during these 50 days, you're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. That's fine. During these 50 days, I challenge you, do not miss an opportunity to rejoice. They'll be around you. Do not miss an opportunity to rejoice. Do not pass up the butterfly and keep your head focused on your phone. Do not pass up the invitation from that person in your family who is trying to draw you out into conversation. Do not pass up the good things in your life. Do not choose the cynicism over the joy, because that is not the Christian way. For 50 days, rejoice. For God is good. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, we are so, so grateful for that which we've been given. And this morning especially, we remember that we have been given so, so much. We remember that we have been given the presence of God. We remember that we've been given the grace of God. We remember that we have been given people with whom we share this life, friends and family and companions and a church. We remember that we have been given fellowship within the body of Christ and the communion of Christ. And we remember that we have been given the gift of blessing others as we love and live for you in this world. And so heavenly father come. And for every heart that is gathered here this morning, we pray that you would break us open. God, right now, I pray that for those of us who are confusing goodness with something that is not good, that you would open our eyes to the to the things that are real in our life. God, to those of us who are just numbing and numbing and numbing, I pray that you would tear down the walls and allow us to feel what we feel and engage the real things in our life. And God, to those of us who have kept you at arm's length, I pray that you would come in, tear down the walls we have built between ourselves and the presence of God, that the presence of God might come and do transformative transformative work within us come holy spirit come we are here and we are yours this we pray as we say together the prayer our lord taught our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.